All right, so uh, welcome to our panel. Yes, maybe try to split. Try to split the room. What's that? Yeah, I think you're good. All right. So we have a student volunteer who's going to be taking around the mic uh, for student questions. So this is our panel, which we've chosen to call Getting Productive in Research. And so, you know, I think many of us as researchers, we struggle with trying to figure out how to integrate kind of long-term productivity into our lives with all like the failure that we face, for example, paper rejections, or you work on ideas for maybe a few months and it just doesn't pan out, or you realize somebody's already worked on it for a long time, that kind of thing. And so that was really what motivated my topic, you know, for choosing this for the panel. And um, maybe uh, we could start with the panelists kind of going this way to this way with the mic, and you can just introduce yourselves, say a few words about kind of your career, and maybe a, a sentence or two kind of about your high-level perspective on this topic. And then we'll try to ease into uh, just getting student questions. If there's a dull moment and we don't get student questions, I'll prompt the panelists for questions. But please, um, it's PLMW, and we're really looking forward to hearing your questions uh, for the panelists. Um, and also, let's try to be mindful about who has the mic, you know, kind of passing it around to make sure everybody gets uh, some roughly equal split of the time. Um, and then, of course, we've got a student volunteer who will be ferrying the microphone around. During the session, uh, please uh, speak into the mic, and also a few notes. First, the session is being live streamed uh, as a consequence of the fact that people who can't attend PLMW can watch it uh, live. And then afterwards, um, I think, where did we land on deciding to record or not record the panel? Are we, um, I think we can figure it out later, but I think in past years it's not been recorded. We're thinking it might be recorded this year. Just be mindful of the fact that if you ask a question, it could be possible it could be recorded and appear. Um, so, you know, use that to inform your, your questions. And if there's something that you think uh, afterwards, you know, must be off camera, feel free to convey that to me as well, and I'll make sure that makes it in. All right, um, so maybe we can start with Leo. Hi. Hi, I'm Leo. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at UMD. I work on property-based testing and formal verification and their interplay. Uh, I did my undergrad at Penn under this person, uh, my PhD at Penn under this person. Uh, so a lot of the advice I will give, probably he will give as well. Um, but I think that my main high level take on the topic is that in order to be productive, you also need to have fun on the side. If you don't have fun while doing research, or while not doing research, then you won't have fun doing research and be productive. Hi everybody, my name is Benjamin and um, I am a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been interested in lots of different things over the years but kind of all circling around types and type systems and things like that. Um, and <laughs> so naturally Leo said what I was going to say but, uh, but I'll, I'll say a different take on it. Um, which is uh, one way to have fun is to um, is to realize that in lots of areas, and, and we're fortunate in PL that this is definitely one of those areas, is that uh, you can prove theorems on Mondays and Wednesdays and hack on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it can all be contributing to the same thing. Um, and if you're like me, proving theorems is, can be fun, but it's kind of hard, uh, and hacking uh, is always fun. So, uh, so kind of mixing it up is what I'm saying is a is a way to make things fun for yourself. And if you're the kind of person that that just likes one or the other, that's fine too. But um, but maybe developing a taste for looking at problems from different sides and um, and enjoying the different perspectives and the different um, cognitive styles is a way to keep it fun. All right, hi everybody. I am Cyrus Omar. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I lead the Future of Programming Lab. Um, so I'm really uh, 
So I, I, I've had an interesting journey into programming languages. I started my PhD in neuroscience, and I uh, switched two years into my PhD into programming languages. I had taken an undergrad PL course, but I got on a, a moving train, right, really needing to understand this brand new field uh, in a PhD program for the first time. Uh, I was really motivated by trying to build better tools for science, motivated by kind of helping my past self out. Uh, and I think that's really important when you get really deep in the weeds of proving theorems or hacking on things to remember that there are ultimately programming languages are how we interact with computers as humans. Um, and you are a human. All your friends are humans. You're building things for people that you care about. Um, and so remembering that, I think, is really central to productivity. Basically. I can talk more about that. Thanks, Cyrus. Uh, so I'm uh, Dan Lyon. I'm, uh, uh, I feel like an academic, but I, I work at Microsoft Research. Fortunately, they let me do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, and I'm, I've always, actually from the start, been inspired by the beauty of functional programming. And I think maybe that's part of what people mean with fun, is that you, you, be, you must be kind of inspired, right, I think, to be a researcher. Uh, you, you show that too, right? Um, and I think it's a very important part. I work on the COCA language uh, where I try to use beautiful theory and solid uh, semantic foundations to actually still get really good performance. Um, and um, so the, the, the drawback of being at a lab uh, like Microsoft Research is that, you know, there's some pressure to, to publish or uh, to do something useful. Uh, and I always try to not think about that too much, but still try to be productive, right? And I think there's always, especially as a PhD student, there are kind of different facets to it. Uh, I think one of them as a PhD student, or I struggle with that a bit, is uh, like what to work on, like what, what's a great, how to get an idea, basically. Like so many people I see struggling with that. They can kind of stuck and they, they're not sure, like what is it really that I want to do? Uh, so that, that's one thing I could talk about more. The other thing is, uh, once you have something going, is the how to make it actually into a well-contained paper instead of stuff you did during a few months, right? Uh, e even if it's really cool, I see often people struggle making, uh, I call that a story. Uh, yeah, so that's another thing I think that often comes up if you want to you know, be productive. I, I don't think, that, that shouldn't be a goal by itself, right? You want to teach the world about what you've learned. Uh, that, that's research, I think. Uh, but right, it, it's, it's nice that it actually works out. So there's, there's that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Excellent. Uh, we have a fourth empty, or a fifth empty chair here. Uh, unfortunately, Mae Milano was not able to make it. She's stuck in Portland. So we'll very much miss her uh, perspective as well. Maybe we can start with a student question. Um, while we're identifying someone, um, anybody want to go first? I guess I would say one thing that I really struggle with as a researcher when I first started my PhD was just I feel very like how to differentiate research from like things that you're excited about and want to work on but they're not research and they're never going to lead to a paper and how do you you know that kind of thing or you know that's kind of a, a feeling that I, I really struggle with a lot um, so that'll be my contribution and then maybe we can identify a, a student who wants to go next. So I have a question. So from my, you know, past experiences of interacting with other PhD students and advisors, I have noticed the fact that basically a successful PhD is, you know, underlined by the current that you know what you are doing is useful and you have an interest in it. But there's a problem of, you know, finding a domain that you have very strong interest in. And I'm interested about the question of whether, you know, after bachelor's or master's, having some industry experience is useful for this? Thank you. Maybe Dan, you'd be, uh, you'd probably be the most relevant. Maybe, uh, right. Is industry experience, like, a good thing to figure out what, really, what you want to work on, right? Um, uh, it, it, um, it, it's a difficult question. I, I think so, but it's also a bit, uh, it's a bit risky that, well, maybe not. Uh, if you don't really know what you want, like what your passion is, then it, it makes sense to like delay the PhD a bit, right? To find what it is. And I think working at a company might help, 
for example, make you realize like, oh, that's really not what I want. Let's let's go do a PhD. Or the other way around, that you actually notice like, you know, I love working on uh, uh, whatever the company is doing. Or maybe you identify in the industry something that you feel like, ah, this is really not the best uh, state of things could be in. And maybe in that way you find what you're passionate about, right? Uh, uh, I see that myself a bit when I work at, uh, uh, let, let's be secretive, uh, at certain divisions of Microsoft, <laughs> there's giant C++ programs, <laughs> and they're very hard to manage. There's like uh, memory management is usually the biggest issue, and, and they basically, how do they get around changing big programs like that? They're really big, right? It's not like, oh, I can easily see that this change won't affect anything. They just hire very expensive engineers with tons of experience and put manpower on it. Right? But I see always like, wow, if we just could improve the language and make sure we can do more compositional building of such software, um, where things are more independent, that would really help. And maybe it could be an inspiration, right? For, for a PhD, for example. Uh, yeah, maybe someone... Does anyone else have industry experience? Were you all academics? All the time. Never had an internship in industry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I interned at Microsoft. <laughs> I, mean, I, so I will say, I mean, I didn't have an internship in industry or anything. I did biology research for a long time, but that gave me a perspective into a class of problems that um, I still think about, like that that class of users. So it doesn't have to be experience in industry, but experience somewhere. It could be through a hobby that you have, right? It could be through something uh, that you did over a summer. Academic setting. So, um, if you really just love the methods of programming languages research, maybe you don't need this. But if you really want to build things for a group of people, it's really helpful to have experience with those people or ask those people. I've got another question right here. Hello. This is a question I ask my advisor on probably a weekly basis, but I'm going to ask again. How do you deal with transitioning from being an undergraduate where every week if you don't finish your homework, say, that means you're doing terribly. But if you are working on a PhD and you don't finish your problem every week and you show up to the meeting every week saying, here's why I didn't finish the problem I'm working on, you're doing great. How do you switch between those two mindsets effectively? It's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> when, you're a, when you're doing research, you're spending almost all of your time not even knowing what the question is. And once you figure out the question, then you're maybe most of the way, or, or, or it's kind of just work to get to the answer. Um, so, so being productive as a researcher is, is a lot. Learning to just kind of live in the question about what the question is. Uh, and, and developing strategies, both kind of psychological strategies for like, being comfortable with that kind of uncertainty, but also uh, strategies for making progress anyway, uh, and you know, learning things uh, despite the, the kind of um, uh, waffliness of the enterprise. Uh, and there are a lot of specific things that um, maybe other people can comment on, but but just recognizing that that is the situation is helpful. Yeah, so I'll echo that a bit, obviously. But uh, I think the one of the things that is that makes the tradition hard is that you don't even know how to measure progress, right? I remember when I was doing my first salt, like big first, like taking the lead paper on luck. Uh, I was meeting with Benjamin basically every week, and the meeting went to my head at the time exactly the same way. I explained the same idea that I'm having in a slightly different way, and like again and again, and trying to explain the same problem and the same solution in a slightly different way every time, or maybe making a bit of a progress. But it was, for like a couple of months there, it felt like I was doing the exact same thing every week. And now looking at it back, it was no, it was just trying to find the question and trying to find the story underlying the whole thing. And that's not an easy transition to make, but at some point you'll have to start thinking about not what you did, but how you can explain to people that haven't thought about what you've done for the last year and a half. So 
making that transition is the, I think, one of the crucial bits. So we got one question here, and then we've got another question over here after that. Yep. A very big question, but um, what attracted you all to programming language research? What else would one want to do? <laughs> yeah, I've kind of talked uh, a little bit about it, but I thought I was writing, um, I was trying to build a simulation of the, the rat visual cortex <laughs> at uh, Los Alamos National Lab where there was a big supercomputer built out of cell processors. The PlayStation 2 or 3 had this processor. Asymmetric multi-core, different user-managed caches, really complicated piece of hardware. And all the libraries for this were written in uh, uh, Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> not even the latest version of Fortran. <laughs> um, and I found myself like not thinking about science all summer and just thinking about how to build better programming languages and tools to take the, the really interesting conversations I was having on whiteboards with fellow scientists and then trying to turn those into things that the computer runs, that was taking so long, so and it was so disjoint, those two ways of thinking, that I thought there was a better way to do that. And then it became a side project to build those better ways to do things, and then I looked around and decided that, that I was having more fun doing that. And here I am. <laughs> a long story short. Yeah. A great story. <laughs> I love it. Uh, uh, I, I'll just keep it short, but right, for me, uh, uh, you know, the real world is so messy, but then if you're in programming languages, it's all very precise and nice, <laughs> like the world is how it should be. And actually, this is why another thing I love about programming languages in particular is that it, it's very close to mathematics and very precise semantics, and that's also what we should work on, like, like not Fortran, but... <laughs> ahead, right? Like, because if you want to move humanity, maybe that's a big ideal, but to move humanity ahead, we need really uh, to move the programming languages ahead, right? And, and I think mathematics is a really important component of that, and it's a really one of the few fields where this all can come together. And you're like, oh, I've had this beautiful type system, I can show it's all sound, and now actually my optimizer can use it, and I do very low-level register stuff, and it all comes together in, in a beautiful way. I think that's uh, quite, quite special about PL, right? It's also a really hard field because who wants a new programming language, right? Like, so <laughs> that's the drawback. But you know, if you're, if you're just happy, yeah, this may be another thing for PhDs or be productive in research, you gotta be happy intrinsically, not by out external success so much, like how, how popular is my language, because then uh, I would be very unhappy, for example. <laughs> <laughs> something to watch out for, right? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for answering all these questions. So I presume all of you work in research teams, right? And research itself can be a frustrating process sometimes. So what makes a good research team? And what do you guys do if there's something off or something's not working well with you or your research fellows? That's a great question. This is what I meant by uh, cutting the recording out. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a hard question to know how to, how to work, you know, how the intersection of like, you know, team management and research especially. It's a hard question to answer generically because hard situations tend to be specific. Um, I would say start by the, the, the times when I've successfully navigated situations like that have been by kind of addressing it head on, like recognizing, oh, there's an interpersonal situation going on here. We need to step back from the technicalities and, um, and deal with people's feelings and experiences. Um, and kind of create a, um, I guess in order for that to work, uh, it helps if there's a friendly atmosphere to begin with. Right, but all of that is very generic. Maybe somebody else has had time to think of something more specific. Yeah, I had, um, 
I've had situations where it's been uncomfortable working with my PhD students before because generally PhD students, they're the first point in their life where they're really failing at something. You know, if you're working on a company, probably if you're you know, a PhD student, you might easily be the kind of person who could work your entire life and get great validation from the company. And in research, we have to fail because if we're not failing, then we're really not working at the state of the art. And um, that's been uncomfortable for some of my PhD students because I've had to ultimately say, this is not good enough. This you know, will not get into a conference as it is now. It's, you know, this, it's not explored, it's not fully baked enough. But I think Benjamin is right in the sense that you have to, you know, you have to make sure there's an avenue where the advisor is gonna respect their students always and gonna have their best interests at heart. But it, it is a situation where there are going to be uncomfortable situations um, because you have to confront failure to be able to make progress. And that's something that's very unique about doing a PhD uh, or doing research, is that if you're not failing, you're not doing, you know, you're not doing your job right. Yeah, and to add to that, I think one of the ways we can cope with certain situations like that is basically have enough people around. Like the point of being in a research team is that it's a team. There are other people there, and there are other people that are struggling either at the same time or struggle in the past or will struggle in the future. So having a lot of lab mates that are in similar stages in your career or other peers, whether that's postdocs or professors later on, like you are going to need some kind of support group. It doesn't have to be in PL in particular, but if it is in PL in particular, that's even better. Have, just having access to other people that are around the same stage in their progression where you can share your problems and you can get out of the, oh, I'm only meeting with my advisor on a one-on-one, -on -one. there's nobody else to talk to and this project is my life. Just getting out of that mentality, extremely important. So big research team, big team of people around you. Another, uh, we have some uh, much more questions. Let's see. Um, you raised your hand for, oh, I didn't realize, my mistake. Hey, we just heard a great talk about how to succeed once you're at grad school and a lot of great questions about that. I'd love to hear, and this is I think more from undergraduates who are thinking about getting into graduate school, how do you succeed literally in the in-between step? You know, you have a year left, your senior year, or maybe you've graduated, and you want to do a PhD, or you think you do, what are the steps, the steps to succeed so that you can start thinking about, okay, now I can make the work-life balance changes. Now I can figure out how to have fun with my research. What's the in-between like? Is, is this a question about like how to succeed in getting into graduate school or like, or? Specifically in PL and also like, not just like, oh, you know, do well in your GREs, but also like, sorry, um, you know, what, sort of makes the beginning of a successful journey, yeah, in a metaphorical sense, but yeah, also literally, like, what are some strategies for doing well and finding a good advisor and getting in? All right, so that's lots of questions. <laughs> which, are, which are the Haskell extensions you have to learn? <laughs> so the, uh, I'll, I'll address one that's kind of easy, which is uh, how do you get into graduate school, um, which is letters. The most important thing is letters. The second most important thing, letters. Third most <laughs> important, letters. Um, after that, uh, grades, research that you've done, etc. cetera. Um, but the main point of doing research is, well, getting experience and uh, knowing what you want to do with your life and things like that, but also working closely with people that can write you letters. It's, it's really all about the letters. Of course, I'm not in an academic institution, so you know, take my advice with a grain of salt. But to me, um, the best you can end up is like a supervisor that kind of you pick, and often that can happen because you can spend that year like reading papers and seeing what research do I find interesting and who wrote that paper, and then maybe do a, a hacking project on something that that person is doing. So you get a uh, you can at some point maybe even email that that person or, or you know write a letter, but you'd be more specific. You'd be like, ah, I read this paper of you, and I am really interested in this kind of research. And then often uh, a, a potential uh, supervisor will also pick you because they're like, oh well, this person is really already kind of very motivated, and this will allow you also to explore what what is your interest, right? Uh, but then you know I'm not. 
I'm not an academic institution, so maybe it's also a risky strategy. But if the supervisor, nah, nah, I already have enough people, right? So, but uh, at least you figure out wh what you would like to do. Right? So on the on the, um, the question of getting a good letter, um, you know, it's not that you have to finish a project and accomplish something, and then the letter says that that happened. It's that you want the letter to speak to how you're thinking, your motivations, the way you organize, you're thinking about this this new big topic, right? Uh, how do you you know are you asking questions in a way that indicates that you're slowly building up a knowledge base, not just kind of flailing a little bit, right? And so demonstrating to somebody that you're systematically thinking about programming languages is more important, I would say, than actually like. 100% finishing a project, that depends on all sorts of factors, right? You can do really great research and realize that the problem that the approach you were taking isn't going to work, and that can still lead to a really great letter if you systematically, you know, made progress each week and showed that you're thinking here. In terms of uh, specific stuff, I would say, for me, uh, intuitionistic logic and natural deduction style rules, learning how to read those, that was very, very important, um, because in undergrad, Nobody, at least the school that I went to, nobody teaches you how to do that. And there's a big divide between that like compositional, you know, natural deduction style reasoning and what I started seeing in PL. Um, I have two questions. I'll just ask the first one. So personally, uh, my undergrad was a completely different domain. Like it wasn't even related to computer science. So I got introduced to PL. Only during my master's, um, I have only like a couple of courses and my research is just my master's thesis. So would you suggest for someone like me to directly apply for PhD after my master's or is it better to take like a couple of years to work in the industry and maybe do some, you know, more research on my own and then apply like what would better my chances of getting into and succeeding it at a PhD? So I guess I might be a good person to, to answer this question. Um, I think if your motivations are very clear uh, around why you want to do programming languages research after the experiences that you've had, you can go right into it with the understanding that it's going to feel even more overwhelming at the beginning. I mean, I you know I got a I got a B in my graduate type systems course when I started, right? <laughs> um, because it was like really a new topic to me and I just knew I wanted to design programming languages and yeah, you really need to know that stuff and it, I was in a class with people that were, had studied it for many years already. Um, I mean, it would, maybe we can talk offline about your specific situation. I mean, it, you know, as far as getting into graduate school without the experience, um, you know, it, sometimes it can be helpful to a master's or spend an extra year doing research just to, to build up that uh, that experience set. In other cases, you have enough experience in something else and can clear enough motivation and then you know, get enough letter from somebody that uh, they can make sense. So talk to me later and yeah, chat more with you. Can I add one thing to that? Um, so specifically, what makes a good set of letters? You need a letter from somebody that you've worked with directly and that can really speak to you as a researcher. Uh, ideally a researcher in programming languages. Um, then you need a couple more letters that do not need to be quite so specific. It's, it's great if they are, but, uh, but if, there's, if there's one person that really, really knows you and can, uh, and can talk about why they think you're going to be very successful as, as, a, uh, as an academic and, and researcher, um, that's enough, and then, the, and then if the other letters just say, you know, this person is great for, for these other reasons, like they were a fantastic TA in my course, or, uh, or they did research with me on something else, or, uh, or you know, some, the more specific the better, but, but the details of the specifics don't matter as much as the enthusiasm and the specificity. Yeah, I think specific details are like so important in these letters. Yeah. A few other um, questions. I have one more question. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so at least according to the internet, the dropout rate of PhD in USA is extremely high. So as advisors, do you find any like common traits or commonalities between P students who do succeed in a PhD in completing a PhD more specifically? 
um, one main thing is being able to work in a self-directed way. So going beyond coursework and really uh, being able to exist in the question and, and make progress. Um, the ones that do the best are the ones that are able to drive the process themselves. So the people that come into a meeting every week or whatever uh, and say, uh, this is what I did, this is where I got stuck, this is what I want to do next, what do you think? Um, that's very different. That's a very different situation from uh, tell me what to do or variants. Also, I'd challenge the fact that succeeding in a PhD means completing it, honestly, right? Like, I know a lot of people who are, like, after two years, got a master's and left academia and are way, way happier for it because it's a better fit for them, right? So, like, it's, it's not a failure if you realize that a PhD, like after a couple of years, after taking courses and starting a couple of journeys, it's not a failure to go and make three times what I make in, in history, right? Like, <laughs> I, that's not a failure. Assuming that you like what you do and you didn't fail because like a bad support system, like there are obviously cases where like someone failed you. Uh, but uh, as Benjamin said, Doing a PhD is about driving it yourself. Doing, doing a PhD is about figuring out what you want to work with, where failure is not only an option, like it, it's likely to happen because otherwise it's not interesting enough, and being lucky enough to pick a topic that you can both solve and is interesting enough to other people. Right? So there are a lot of parameters that have to fall into place. Um, but overall, uh, I'd say that the one thing I'm, and I think all of us at PLMW are striving to do is keep people that want to succeed in academia and are fit, are like, like, would like to be in academia, keep them around and try to support them more by mentoring. Yeah, I would say, you know, also I noticed very specifically a lot of students have trouble at the end of their third year where they're done with classes and they have to write their first big conference paper. That is very, very hard for everyone. And it's a time that I think, you know, you have to fail a lot. You know, maybe you work on something and you realize it's just not going to turn into a research paper because of this aspect. And so you kind of pivot. You do a bunch of pivoting. That's the time I think is really hardest for everybody that I've known. We have, um, yeah, also, and where is the mic right now? Oh, great, great. Uh, just quickly, I think, uh, uh, right, succeeding, I, I think, uh, um, so one thing, yeah, Benjamin already said, you have to be intrinsically motivated. You must love the thing you're doing. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be, yeah, you can't just do it just to get a PhD, right? Or to make a paper. It's like, you have to just love what you're doing. That's hard, right? You have to figure that out. The other thing, I think, what often goes wrong is, is kind of the wrong supervisor or the wrong match. Maybe that's it. So I would say it's really really important to find the right person to work with. It doesn't have to be your, even your initial supervisor. It could be someone else you meet later, but you need someone who uh, is interested in what you're doing too, or you're interested in what they're doing, and you can kind of work together, so you can kind of go deep on the subject. If you meet every week and your supervisor is not really into what you're doing, it's going to be much tougher. Right? You can still do it if you're self-directed enough, but uh, it, I think it really helps if you find a match. And I, I know that's hard. Like, th then, yeah, go to conferences like this and meet people. That really can give a, a lot of uh, help. Sorry, yep. Uh. Uh, back to the topic of like, early on everybody said that like, in order to succeed in research, you need to be happy, you need to be enjoying this and all that. Like, in my situation, I am happy when I uh, I feel like, like I'm doing good. I'm happy when I'm good at what I'm doing. I am really bad at research. <laughs> Will this like improve later on? Like, how do I overcome this? I think it gets easier once you have some success, right? <laughs> Let's get easier. My first PhD advisor was a very wise man named Nico Habermann, um, the creator of the CMU School of Computer Science. Um, and one thing that he said to me very early on that has stuck with me uh, ever since was, 
He said, Benjamin, nothing worth doing is fun all the time. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, I'll also say something my advisor said to me when I was starting. Uh, <laughs> I think it was along the lines of, that, that was way early on, like, it was like first PL club, like our reading group at Penn, first September I'm there. And it was something along the lines of, like of course if you work more, like people who work more will do better because they put more effort in. But f there comes a point of diminishing returns, right? Like after a while, the more effort you put in, you're just burning yourself out. And one of your jobs as a PhD student is not to burn yourself out, is to find out where that line is, which is different for every person. And consciously be above or below it at different points. Right? If you're close to a deadline, you should know that you're spending more time than you should on a regular basis, but that's like a one-week thing where you're actively trying to push something out. And then, like the week or two after, you can just take a step back and not work nowhere near close to the line. So your job is managing your time in order to be able to keep having fun, but not all the time, at some point. There will be parts of the thing that you're struggling with or you're not happy with, right? Like in a field like PL where it's both theory and systems and evaluation and a bit of coding and a bit of everything, if you like all of those aspects, that's great. If you don't like all of those aspects, well, you still need to do all of them for a paper if, if your topic is something related. So if it's like three or four, it's like, yeah, who cares? It's still fun. Keep, find fun in the bits you like fun. Find fun outside of work. And then the one thing that you don't like, maybe you don't like evaluating your system, or maybe you don't like proving some theorem about it. Well, yeah, that, that's one part of the job that you'll get through because everything else is fun. Where's the mic right now? Oh, great. Um, one of you said earlier that to get into grad school, you need like good letters and one of them from someone who knows you well and you've done research with. How do you get that in the first place, like in undergrad before grad school, especially if you're interested in like pure theory rather than um, like programming in PL? Find somebody whose work you think is interesting read some of their papers, go ask them questions, and let the conversation about research grow out of that. That's, that's one tried and true strategy that works pretty well. Um, and then ideally it leads to an independent study and, uh, and so on and so on. But, uh, but beginning with a, a kind of concrete personal connection to uh, things that they're already interested in and, and can talk to you about uh, is a really smooth way of making the connection. All right, I think we're being reminded to speak into the mic. Is that right? Awesome, okay. <laughs> so, so if you find yourself interested in a topic that's not well represented at your university or wherever you are, uh, you can totally talk to people at a conference like this. You can cold email them. Um, to just echo what Benjamin's saying, I think uh, having received a lot of cold emails, the ones that really stand out are the ones where someone has put in a little bit of effort on their own to go and read some of the recent papers in the group. And a really good, it's often the case that it's, you're not going to understand the entire paper, and that's totally fine. Asking me concrete questions about the paper is endearing. Looking at the future work section and saying that f piece of future work that you said would be cool, I want to do that, that's really good. You can skip the parts of the paper you didn't understand and just read the future work section. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you start the future work, you'll have to understand the prior work and that'll give you reason to really deeply understand that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, we, we all know how to work on Zoom now, so you know you don't need to find somebody you know, at, at, at your university or anything. We just have time for one more question. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe she could be last. Where is the? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. So I'm sure that you're all aware of the disturbing trend that more and more computer science departments are de-emphasizing programming languages, and some departments don't even require a course in uh, programming languages anymore. So I see there's a lot of undergraduate students here. If they're in such a program, 
what can they do to uh, build up credentials in programming languages. Let's do one more question also, since we had a student to ask after this. I think, uh, I forgot who said it, but I think Good Benjamin, question. but uh, one way is right, if no, in right. your department there's not enough like PL folks around, or, or people that do not do what really interests you, often like uh, people at other institutions and places, they, they have little projects, and if you write them and like, hey, do you have some fun master's project that I could potentially do, or some idea what we could do, or could we meet about it? That may well pan out, right? Uh, it happened to me, for example, uh, twice already, uh, with Elton there, and, and Anton, uh, Lorenz and two. They were both like writing me out of the blue, and, and is this something we could do for masters? And it's, it's harder, because it will be remote, and, and you have to be self-motivated. But uh, it could be an excellent way, right, to, to, to build those credentials. Right? Uh -huh. And our last question. Um. So uh, some of you guys mentioned that talking to people at a conference like this is a good way to make connections and learn about PL and stuff like that. I think for a lot of people here, this might be the first conference you're going to. And you come here and you don't know almost anyone. And so it's hard to start up conversations with people, especially people that you see as senior researchers and advanced in the field and things like that. So do you have advice on like starting these conversations, having these conversations, like you, you go out to the coffee hour and people are already in the, their little groups talking to the people they know. So it, it, yeah, it's hard to interrupt it. Yeah. Maybe someone else can speak to the interrupting people bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've always just been rude and walked in on conversations. Um, <laughs> um, when you have the conversations, I think one really important thing is you know, some, when, when someone's describing the work that they're doing, uh, they're going to start using words you don't understand or knowledge that you don't have. And it's, it's tempting to just, like, nod when they, like, say something and, and uh, act like you understand or say, like, you can continue. I don't need you to stop and explain. But actually, it's a lot better to be like, hold on, you're, like, moving way too fast. Can you, like, break break this down, can you explain to me the first principles of this problem that you're working on? Lots of people love doing that. Uh, you know, I love doing that when someone's like, actually, I don't understand, you know, what you're talking about. What is, I don't know, what is an editor semantics or something, right? And uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, let me get a piece of paper out. Let me show you what this means. Right? Like, it's really fun to do that. And so don't worry that you're, like, burdening somebody with that. Um, and, and that's a form of on honesty as well, right? That if you don't understand something, don't act like you do. One trick for um, insinuating yourself into, uh, into groups is just walk up and join a conversation. Just walk up and literally stand there. Uh, a few conversations that happen at conferences are going to be kind of closed and the, the people are really focused on each other and they're, and they're really wanting to, uh, to you know, have that conversation with each other. But typically not. Uh, and you'll see from their body language. Right? People will like turn a little bit to open up the group uh, to let you join, or they won't. If they don't, it's fine. Find another. Uh, if they do, now you're part of the conversation. At the beginning, you're just listening. After a while, somebody says, oh, and who are you? <laughs> and then it goes from there. So it's a, it's a trick, but it's a trick that works pretty well. All right, excellent. Yeah, um, one last. Oh yeah, point. sure, of course. Uh, of course, you should watch Paulette's talk because that's what she's going to talk about. Uh, but it's as important as it is to your head right now to meet the senior people. I would like to say that's even more important to meet the people in your cohort, right? Because I mean, even from my first either PLMW or summer school, like I met Cyrus and Chris, like during my first year, and I've been hanging around with them forever, like for the last eight, ten years, however long that is. So like the people you see around you are going to be your cohort coming to conferences, assuming you go into, you keep coming into PL conferences. So meeting them is almost more important than meeting Benjamin. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate to be here. And thank you, everybody, for asking so, such good questions. Right, thanks. Let's thank our panelists.